Have you ever heard of Cinderella? Well, I've got something to tell you. Evil stepmothers are not just in fairy tales. Before you go on calling me dramatic, you have to hear my story. My stepmother makes Medusa look like an absolute saint. Get ready for a story full of tears, crime, and a whole lot of corn. You're probably wondering, what's so evil about corn? Trust me, you'll know by the end of the story. You'll just have to be patient. In the meantime, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. If you don't, your worst enemy will win the lottery. You don't want that, right? Not that winning the lottery is always a good thing, though. That's actually where all of my troubles began. See, when I was five, my mother left my father and I. She never gave a reason, apparently. Just left a note and walked out. I don't even know her name. I don't remember much about her from my childhood at all, but I do remember my dad. My dad was charming and perfect in every way. He was a complete gentleman to everyone. Although he wasn't the most handsome or fit guy, he was a plumber and women wouldn't look his way. It was just us for years, and I loved it. Then, $2 changed our lives forever. We were walking and saw a scratch ticket on the ground. We figured we should try to play, so we picked it up and scratched it. We were only expecting to win a dollar or two, but we ended up winning the jackpot. Five million dollars! I was super happy at first, but I had no idea just how different our lives were going to be. My dad bought a mansion and a pony, and he invested the rest, quickly tripling his fortune. We were rich beyond our wildest dreams, and people started to take notice. It wasn't long before my dad was dating again. At this point, he could have had anyone he wanted. For some reason, he chose Taylor. Taylor was young and pretty, and it was obvious she was only after my father's fortune. But my dad was too love-struck to see the obvious and always told me I was just jealous of him dating. There was this one time she asked me if I wanted to help buy a gift for my dad. I agreed, thinking she wanted to do something nice. I gave her $6,000 to go towards buying him a new watch. Well, she came back from shopping with a $20 watch from the gas station and a $6,000 dress. When I confronted her, she told me that she dressed up for him and her looks were the gift. Yeah, I think that particular event was the beginning of the end of my tolerance for her. After that incident, we were always fighting. We could barely be in the same room. I wanted my dad to leave her and she wanted to keep mooching off of his fortune. My dad and I fought a lot about Taylor. Eventually, we decided it was best for me to go to boarding school. It felt like he was picking her over me and I was hurt. I still feel guilty about what I said the night before I left. He said he would miss me, and I told him he didn't have to. Just make Taylor leave. Who do you love more, her or me? I shouted. He refused to answer, so I told him I hated him and ran away. Instead of saying goodbye or telling him I loved him, I woke up early on the day of my flight and took a taxi there by myself. I texted him, letting him know I would text him when I arrived. Unfortunately... I would never get the chance to say a proper goodbye or tell him that I loved him. In fact, I hate you was the last thing I ever got to say to him. Turns out, when he got the text, he was so upset that he decided to drive out to say a proper goodbye. Sadly, he never made it to the airport. He got in a huge car accident. I was still at the airport when I got the phone call and left the airport immediately. I even left my suitcases behind. Sadly, by the time I got to the hospital, he had already died. I was devastated, but you know who wasn't? You guessed right, Taylor. All she could think about was what was in the will. It was actually the first thing she asked me when she saw me at the hospital. So do you know where your dad keeps the will? I was so angry, but I kept my cool because I had some information that would hurt her more than any insult would. Yeah, I do, and he left nothing to you. I laughed, she nearly <laughs> passed out on the spot. When we got back to the house, I pulled out the will and everything was being left to me. Her face went pale like a ghost and she ran out of the room while dialing the number to her lawyer. I have to admit, I got some satisfaction from her panic. Sadly, I did not get the last laugh. After she talked to her lawyer, I did not see or hear from her in days. She didn't even come to his funeral. I thought I had won and she was finally out of my life. I couldn't be more wrong. Turns out... She had spent all that time away searching through the whole will for any type of loophole. Unfortunately for me, she found one. On the day of the official will reading, she was there with her lawyer. 
She had a smug look on her face that made me super suspicious. I waited to see if there was anything I missed or maybe something she changed, but no, it was all going to me. Then the speaker said something that made me fall out of my chair. Literally. Do you know how in medieval times, if a prince became a king during his childhood, someone else would step in as the ruler until they were a full adult? That's kind of how the inheritance worked. Until I was 18, my guardian would be in charge of my funds. When the speaker asked who that was, Taylor raised her hand. My jaw dropped and I immediately said that wasn't true. She was just my dad's girlfriend. She smirked at me and whipped out a paper. If I'm not your guardian, then what are these? She asked. They were adoption papers, like fully legal adoption papers. And to my horror, my signature was at the bottom of the page. I tried to say I never signed anything like this before in my life, but Taylor insisted I was grieving. Nobody believed me and I was forced to drive home in the car with my least favorite person in the world. She told me there was going to be a lot of changes in my life. She told me that I needed to work around the house and get a job to pay bills to learn responsibility. She also disenrolled me from the boarding school I wanted to go to. I was super mad and I said I wanted to be as far away from her as possible. She told me she had already booked a one-way ticket to a boarding school in another country. She wouldn't tell me the name of the school and didn't give me much time to pack. At first, I thought this was because she was trying to get rid of me. It became all too apparent what she was trying to do, though. Let's see how long it will take you guys to figure out the plan she had up her sleeve. When I arrived in the country, I was greeted by a woman holding a sign with my name on it. She looked very scary and strict, just wearing dark sunglasses and a large black jacket. It all seemed straight out of a horror movie. I told her I would just drive to the school with a taxi, and that's when she told me that I would follow her or else. She was scary, and I did not want to know what the or else part was. Honestly, one of my biggest regrets was not just standing my ground. She walked me over to a car and opened the trunk. I assumed it was for my bags, so I leaned in. Then she pushed me inside and closed the lid. A few seconds later, she started driving off. I'm assuming leaving all my stuff behind. All I had on me was my wallet and a cell phone with no service. After a couple of hours, we finally stopped. She opened up the back of the car just enough for me to jump out and scream at her. She didn't even bother to listen. She just got back in the driver's seat and drove off. I looked around to see where she left me. A church? In the middle of the woods? Yeah, no thank you. I literally threw a temper tantrum, like a child. After a few minutes of making a scene, a few nuns came out. A few of them spoke English and just explained that they were paid a lot of money to reform me. I tried to run away, but it became apparent that I had nowhere to go. After three hours of wandering around, lost, I showed back up to the church, defeated. The nuns didn't seem so surprised and gave me a change of clothes and a list of chores to do. If you told me I would have traded in my Prada bag and short skirts for church robes and a Bible, I would have never believed you. But there I stayed and grew quite accustomed to the church. I'd come to terms that this would be my life forever as I spent some years there, but one day, my life was about to turn upside down. Remember how I said there would be lots of corn? Well, <laughs> we're getting there. We had a long day of tending to the garden and praying when I caught a glimpse of something I never thought I'd see again. No, it wasn't a laptop or indoor plumbing. It was a man. Apparently, he was delivering some supplies to the church. Normally, his mother did it, but she was sick today. He was going to rest a bit before he took off again on the long drive back to his house. He had to be about my age and was super fit and hot. He must not have seen so many young girls either because he looked back at me with the same sort of fascination. He immediately came up to me and started to compliment me, saying I was much different than the other nuns. I was young and beautiful and he was very attracted to me. I explained that I too was very attracted to him. When he said it was too bad I was a nun, I immediately corrected him, saying it was a long story. Before I could say anything else, the oldest, meanest nun interrupted us. She said it wasn't very ladylike to be talking to boys, and she dragged me away to do other chores. I was worried that was the last I'd ever see of the mysterious man. A couple of hours later, as I was chopping some firewood, I heard some whispers coming from behind a bush. It was the man from before. He told me that if I wanted, he would drive me far away from here. 
He told me to hide under the crops in the back of his truck while he distracted the nuns. Then we just drove off. I was picking corn out of my clothes and hair for hours. Who knew my kidnapping would ruin corn for me? We drove for hours and hours, and I told him everything. He was incredibly kind and sympathetic and said he would do anything to help me. I asked if he had an internet connection at his house, which he did. Well, I didn't even waste a minute when we got to his door. I ran right for a computer and started to log into my Facebook and see what had happened. Most importantly, I wanted to know where Taylor was and who that mysterious woman was. Well, the most shocking thing about my Facebook account wasn't the thousands of missed messages. It was all the people sending their condolences. At first, I thought they were belated wishes about my father I never got to see. But the truth was much more disturbing. People thought I was dead. I used Facebook to call one of my dearest friends. She answered immediately and seemed so shocked to hear from me. But it can't be. You're dead. She started to cry. I explained everything that had happened to me with the strange woman and the monastery, and I asked why everyone thought I died. Apparently, Taylor told everyone I had gotten into an accident overseas and died. Since I was in a third world country, no one ever tried confirming the evidence. She had a death certificate and newspaper articles, my friend told me. If I would have known, I would have helped you. You can still help me, I said with a devilish plan in mind. I asked her to buy me a plane ticket back home. Even though I had come unexpectedly, I always carried my wallet and my robes. I printed out the boarding pass and asked the handsome man to take me to the airport at once. He wholeheartedly agreed and asked me to come back for him when I had my life figured out. My friend met me at the airport with tears in her eyes. She brought me a change of clothes and asked me what the plan was. I asked her if she could have the police come to my house in an hour because I wanted some alone time for a reunion. I showed up to my old house and could see that Taylor had been busy with my fortune she inherited as my legal guardian after I died. There were several expensive sports cars in front of the house and very expensive statues that weren't there when I left. I went right up to the door and knocked and was greeted by a butler. She told me that Miss Taylor was busy, but I told her to let Taylor know it was a family emergency from her daughter. I wish I got a picture of the look on Taylor's face. She screamed when she saw me. How, how is it? How, how are you? She stuttered. I asked her if she really thought nuns could just keep me forever. Nuns? She asked, genuinely confused. You were supposed to be dead. Carly, get down here now. Dead? A few minutes later, I heard the voice of a familiar woman. What are you going on about now, sister? I was sleep. She started. The woman froze when she looked at me. It was none other than the woman who had brought me to the church in the first place. They fought back and forth in front of me. They started throwing faces at each other and screaming. Apparently, Taylor paid her sister to get rid of me, but her sister couldn't go through with it and gave 50% of the hitman money to the nuns to take me in. Taylor turned and asked if anyone else knew I was here, and I got a very uncomfortable knot in my throat. I will never know if she was actually going to hurt me, because the moment she approached me, the cops knocked on the door. Even without the concrete proof of attempted murder, the fraud and robbery were going to keep her locked up for the rest of her life. Plus, she was going to be paying me back for many, many years. It was hard to get back in the groove of my old life, but I guess it's easier when you're rich. I ended up flying out the handsome man who rescued me to live in the country. He ended up hitting it off with my best friend that picked me up at the airport. It seems fitting that my heroes ended up together. As for me, I'm almost done with my university degree, and I'm happy to say I opened up my mansion as a giant foster home so no one has to end up with evil stepmothers.